Welcome to the Scientific Sense podcast where we explore emerging ideas from science, policy, economics and technology. My name is Gil Eppen. We talk with world's leading academics and experts about their recent research or general areas of topical interest. Scientific Sense is an unstructured conversation with no agenda or preparation. We cover a wide variety of domains where new discoveries are made and new technologies are developed on a daily basis. We are most interested in how new ideas affect society and help educate the world how to pursue a rewarding and enjoyable life rooted in science, logic and information. We seek knowledge without boundaries or constraints and provide unedited content of conversations with researchers and leaders who love what they do a companion blog to this podcast can be found at scientificsense.com and this podcast is available on over a dozen platforms and directly at scientificsense.net if you have suggestions for topics guests and other ideas please send them to info@scientificsense.com and i can be reached at gil at epen.info my guest today is professor regina herslinger who is a professor at harvard business school she's the first woman to be tenured and chair at harvard business school and the first to serve on many corporate healthcare medical technology boards her upcoming book innovating in healthcare will be published in the fall of 2020 Welcome Reggie. Thanks so much. Great to be here. Yeah, uh so so you have had a long career both in academics and in private sector innovating in healthcare. Uh before we discuss uh some of the possible solutions uh that you have discussed uh in various forums uh in this healthcare problem that we have, I would like to get your perspectives on the scale of the problem. So we have 330 million people with an average age of 40 uh even though uh, a famous politician infamously said recently nobody knew healthcare is this complex it is clear to most <laughs> Americans that, that that it's a complex problem right. uh you know we often think about four classes of stakeholders right manufacturers providers patients and payers and payers in this context include government and employers and in many cases patients themselves right and all of whom have different objectives and incentives so when we look at the sort of the landscape um of, of this of this industry uh, i come from a it is some long time ago now a manufacturer uh and you know my perspective is that they manufacturers generally have been very very focused on the right side of the age distribution and that is treating diseases after patients have been diagnosed so that is their business really um providers and payers have been playing the risk shifting game with each other and the patients are sort of left to gaze at uncertainty and lack of transparency and often end up making a variety of wrong decisions so in the us context what is the scale of this problem in in dollars and cents well the us spends vastly more than any other country as a percentage of its gdp on healthcare and the rate of growth relative to the rate of growth of gdp is faster than any other country yeah uh that's very scary because healthcare as a whole healthcare delivery is not very productive so the more we spend the less productivity we get to get out of the economic jargon healthcare is very expensive yeah. its quality is virtually unknown because there's almost no transparency except for the kind of transparency we get with medical technology that has to go through the FDA but we really don't know how good our doctors are or how good our hospitals are how good our ambulatory surgical centers are mm-hmm. and because of these two characteristics 
almost 30 million people lack health insurance altogether. And even those who are insured don't get very good access right. unless they're extremely well connected. This problem is not unique to the United States, no matter what the healthcare system is. If it's a single payer system as in um, the UK and Canada, or more of a consumer driven system as in Switzerland or Germany, or a system that promises universal coverage. I don't know why I'm laughing. It's not <laughs> funny, but doesn't, yeah. doesn't deliver anything near it, like China, India, Russia. You know, this is a big problem, and innovation has solved these kinds of problems in other sectors, in high tech, in communication, in self-care. And we need to give innovation a chance to flourish in healthcare. Yeah, I, I was looking at some statistics, uh, Reggie. So this is from the health system tracker, and uh, especially comparing the U.S. to other systems. So they have United States against comparable country averages. And at the very highest level, if you look at all cause mortality rates, uh, it has been falling all around the world uh, in the U.S. as well as elsewhere. And uh, we used to be uh, sort of better than the OECD average, uh, like in the 80s. And uh, over time, uh, we have gotten worse and worse in that metric. Um, I don't know what to read into this. Uh, it is falling, but it's sort of uh, moving away from what the OECD average is. Um, is there any implication of that? I think in healthcare, as you said, it's <laughs> who knew healthcare <laughs> was so complex. So, you know, it's an n dimensional system. And clearly, health status is affected not only by the healthcare system, but by the socio demographic characteristics of the population. <clears throat> how they live, how rural it is. The, the U.S. is among the most rural countries in the world, which in terms of healthcare means it's hard to get healthcare to that rural population. Yeah. So it is, this calls, answering your question, your very appropriate question, but answering it fully would require a multivariate analysis <laughs> yes. which say, you know, what happened to the composition of the population? Yeah. What happened to their living circumstances, their education, how closely they live, thousands of other variables. So I don't take those statistics terribly seriously, yes. even when they're about diseases, special diseases, much narrower focus than all cause mortality. However, it's unquestionable that we spend nearly twice as much as those countries. Mm. And we clearly don't get nearly twice as good results. And most of those European countries have universal insurance. Of course, that doesn't mean everybody in those countries gets access, but it's better than having 30 million people without any insurance. So we've got to do better, <laughs> and we can do better. We have the administrative and uh, technological genius that if it were applied to healthcare, it could do what FedEx, let's say, did for Uber, did for transportation, or what Apple and Microsoft did and Google did for communication. Yeah. We could do it if, if we let those those incredible resources get successfully focused on this problem. Right, right. Yeah, and, and the COVID-19 uh, metrics uh, sort of, uh, you know, exposed 
uh, the status quo a little bit. So I was looking at, you know, hospital admissions for chronic conditions such as COPD, CHF, and diabetes. And we have much higher hospital admissions. And this is, you know, before COVID-19 uh, kicked in. And as you know, these are risk factors for COVID-19 mortality. Now, you could read this in multiple ways. You could say maybe we have a sick population as an initial condition to start with. Or are we, are we treating populations uh, differently from OECD countries? Um, in either case, you know, the hospitalization rates are a lot higher in the U.S. Hmm. I'm surprised to hear that because I looked at those same data. Yeah. And what I saw, Gil, was very surprising. We have two beds per hospital beds per thousand people. Yeah. The UK and Canada have two beds per thousand people. They spend 11% of GDP on healthcare. We spend 18%, mm. but we have the same capacity. Germany, which spends 11% circa, has eight beds per thousand people. Yeah. Japan has 16 beds. Of course, Japanese hospitals includes nursing homes different <laughs> from ours. Korea, which is very similar, the hospitals are similar, 13 beds per thousand, and Germany, Japan, Korea spend much less than the US, yet they have more admissions. Now they may not have I didn't look at the data by disease. Yeah, but yeah. In this is general, yeah. Yeah, exactly. they have this is specific to these three conditions. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. To uh, diabetes, CHF, and COPD. Right. Well, uh, again, those diseases have genetic factors, socioeconomic factors, living condition. Clearly, for example, COPD or respiratory disease uh, is correlated with the cleanliness of the air around you. Yeah. Uh, so there may be other factors that, um, that explain the high rate of hospital admissions, that although in general we have less hospital capacity and fewer admissions and shorter lengths of stay, and yet we pay much more. Yeah. Something's not right with this picture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, I think that is true uh, in aggregate uh, for sure. Uh, and so in a, in a recent uh, article... And wait, wait a yeah. sec, let's just stick with these chronic diseases. Yeah. So these people who have congestive heart failure, which has 34 comorbidity, mm -hmm. which means they have 34 related illnesses commonly, or diabetes, which has kidney disease, heart disease, disease, eye disease, ulcers that don't heal, depression. These people who are so unlucky to have these diseases, they really need continual monitoring. Yeah. And for a long time, that was unavailable to them, except by going to a bricks and mortar place, a doctor's office. And since half of American doctors are employed by hospitals to a hospital, one of the silver linings, if one can term it, the, of COVID-19 is that the administration loosened up the conditions under which telemedicine was made available. It opened up coverage, which means it enabled telemedicine to be paid for when it was used everywhere. It once was paid for only in prisons or rural areas, and it improved the payments so that a physician 
who saw a patient from one of these diseases which need continual monitoring hmm. and not once a year kinds of diseases because of all their many complications, that physician would get paid the same as if she were seeing them in her office. Yeah. Uh, I think that that will drastically change the rate of hospital visits for those diseases. And people worry whether these changes will remain permanent because clearly the bricks and mortar places that have all those fixed costs of the bricks and mortar, they've got to generate the revenue to cover them. And uh, I'm sure there will be extensive bad mouthing of how bad telemedicine is. It is on the average not going to be as good as face-to-face -face visits However, it enables visits that would never happen under a, our present system yeah. that would be very helpful to these people because it'll keep them out of the hospitals. Let me give you an example. Mm -hmm. uh, Ten years ago, I had a student who invented with a colleague at MIT a device, it was a mat and if you stood on the mat, it would measure the temperature in your feet. Hmm. So you and I are not terribly interested in our foot temperature, but if you're a diabetic, the gradient in that temperature yeah. will predict whether you're going to get an ulcer. And or some sort of neuropathy issue. Yeah. Something, yeah. some sort of something. Yeah. something and diabetes destroys the circulatory system right. which means that these wounds don't heal readily and that's why diabetics have so many amputations unfortunately mm. anyway they went through the fda and they showed that by wireless transmission of these temperature data, in other words, another form of telemedicine, they dr drastically reduced the rate of these ulcerations that don't heal. Yes. So it's just an example of what telemedicine can do. Absolutely, yeah. Telemedicine is definitely going to be a game changer. It clearly has a cost benefit, as you say, but there are other side benefits too. I think there was a Johns Hopkins study uh, a few years ago that showed that the, the two most dangerous things to do in the US are driving an automobile or going to a hospital. <laughs> 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 I always say, if you go to a hospital, make sure you bring somebody who really loves you. I mean, really loves you <laughs> and who's assertive and intelligent with you. You just have to do that. So, yes. Um, and it's, the, it's, it's uh, sort of the third highest reason for mortality, right? After uh, cardiac issues and cancer, that things that you pick uh, up. Iatrogenic illnesses, yeah. whether it's third or fourth or fifth, it varies, but it's clearly very high. And it's also a lot of that is MRSA or pathogens that are really incurable. Yeah. If they are cured, it is with enormous difficulty. So a hospital is not a great place to be. And one of the silver linings of COVID-19 is it will empty mm. the hospital out of visits by the chronic disease people you mentioned who really could be cared for in the home or in retail medical clinics like the CVS Health Hub or Walmart is starting them, or Walgreens, or Humana, in very convenient neighborhood locations that are set up to monitor chronic diseases. Mm. Yeah, so so I would like to get into a little bit. Uh, so you had a, uh, an article in the Harvard Business School Weekly, I believe, 
uh, about it's time for a bipartisan health plan for employers and employees. Uh, I don't know what the term bipartisan means, but um, we haven't seen it for a long time. (laughs) (laughs) That's for sure. (laughs) So so you say a recent, uh, you know, that the recent twin economic and pandemic calamities should uh, cause us to rethink the status quo for health insurance compensation. Uh, Must GM be a benefits company that happens to make cars? Uh, or we should, you know, think about it uh, differently. You want to talk a bit about? Um, sure. Yeah. Sure. That article was first published in Health Affairs, where there was a great deal more data. So uh, the uh, Republicans want to control cost, and the Democrats want to increase access. And this bipartisan plan, which I co-authored with a professor of urology in California, accomplishes both. And essentially what it does is it urges employers to offer what's called the public option, which is Medicare to their employees. However, Medicare is uh, tremendously underpriced. It has a a deficit with a net present value of at least 36 trillion. Mm. GDP of the US in a good year is 20 trillion. So 36 trillion is a very significant amount of money. And what it means in English is The people on Medicare pay less, but their children, grandchildren are going to pick up the amount that they don't pay, which is this 36 trillion. So what we want is for the public option to be priced on an actuarially fair basis, Mm -hmm. meaning that it doesn't do this intergenerational transfer. It accounts for the costs of Medicare accurately, and it charges the price that's commensurate with that. Even if Medicare costs were measured accurately, including things like what's called the IBNR, which is a reserve that commercial insurers have for that accounts for expenses that the providers have incurred but haven't yet reported. Even if that were included, Medicare costs would be lower than those of commercial insurers because of Medicare scale. It can just extract volume discounts that the commercial insurance companies have not and perhaps could not do. Yeah. So uh, that's our proposal. Uh, Offer the public option, which would use Medicare pricing, but it would be administered by private insurance companies and offer it to your employees. And we computed the costs compared to the Obamacare costs and to the costs of premiums that are paid by employees of small and medium sized enterprises. Yeah. And the costs, the real costs, not the funny money costs, are still lower than either Obamacare or the commercial premiums. So what this would do is the commercial insurers would get a new line of business but they would also be spurred to become more competitive than they presently are. It's a very moribund industry. Yeah, so... Mostly, let me just give you one example. Mostly they say, no, you can't do this, you can't see her, you can't, you know, only on a Friday, whatever. 
But one thing, for example, they could do, which a federal government cannot do, is they could say, look, if you go to see a doctor in, let's say, Nebraska, which has terrific health care and which costs much less than Massachusetts, for an elective procedure, we're going to lower the costs of your health insurance. The federal government cannot do that. It's mm. politically infeasible to mm. say, I want American citizens to get their health care in Nebraska rather than Massachusetts. So the commercial insurance, just one example, could create different kinds of insurance policies that are great value for the money that a government cannot create. So we believe this plan will not only broaden access and control costs, but it will actually create competition in the private sector, which hasn't existed for a long time, so that it's now competing with a great volume purchaser, which is the public sector. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so I want to understand the mechanics a bit, Reggie. So we have uh, Medicaid and Medicare administered by the government. Uh, these are large patient pools. Medicare, I believe, is about 60 million people or something like right. that. Right. Um, and so what you're suggesting is another pool, is it, uh, that, is, that is called the public option that will be managed by private companies and, and competing in that pool uh, for pricing those, uh, pricing those programs. And employers now, uh, instead of uh, creating uh, their own programs or, or, or having private insurance for their employees, essentially give them an allocation to, to, uh, to let them go to this pool, this public option pool to buy their insurance. Is that the idea? No, okay. not, not quite. The idea is you could buy uh, United or whatever the employer offers and a PPO or an HMO or a high deductible from United. And you could also buy this public option mm -hmm. and United would run the public option. But now United would be losing money to the public option because it's going to be lower price than anything they offer. Yeah. So United is going to think, can I create a competitive product that is lower price than the public option that's still a good product that's not one of these you're going to have a $20,000 deductible or you can see only three doctors or you, you never get covered for this or that. And my answer is yes, they can. They can, they've been very uncreative. And for example, they can create medical travel policies that would send people for elective care mm -hmm. to the best value for the money sites. They haven't done that. Why haven't they done that? They haven't done that because there's been no competitive pressure to do it. Yeah, but will United be forced to play in this public option? No, not at all. So, not so, at all. How, so how, how will the, so again, from a mechanistic perspective, how will it work? There is a, is there a public option market that, that private companies uh, provide uh, or administer? So our idea is whoever the next president is, if he offers a public option, the way he would offer it is the payment to providers would be determined by Medicare. Okay. But the plans would be administered by private firms. I see. Okay. So the pricing is in accordance with Medicare. Uh, but the administration of that would be by private firms. The pricing for the providers, that's called the medical loss ratio. Yeah. And it accounts for about 80 to 85% 
I told you I could do technical. <laughs> so it, just, <laughs> it accounts for about 80 to 85% of the dollar. The remainder is administrative, and that would be under the control of the private insurers. Right. Okay. So if I'm an employer, and if this program kicks in, and right now I have you know, health insurance offered to my employees, uh, what will be the change that I would take? You offer one more policy. Okay. You offer the public option. And the reason you offer it is either it's mandated, you're required to offer it, or it will be so much cheaper that you want to offer it. Now, a very large number of the employees of small and medium enterprises think there are 60 to 70 million of them are uninsured. Yeah. And if I were a small and medium enterprise employer, I'd be very tempted to offer this to my employees once the economy gets back on board. Okay, so will there be sort of an adverse selection problem here, Reggie? You know, uh, will the will the sicker employees um, uh, kind of gravitate toward the public option, uh, and the and the private payers uh, pick up the the younger and less sick people? Uh, there could be that the employers usually handle that gill by taking a holdback from all the policies and that holdback is sufficient to uh, to make sure that this doesn't happen, that they have enough money, that they collect enough money from the well. Yeah. So wherever the sick go, they will have enough money to cover them. Okay, so from an employer perspective, again, there is some sort of a tail risk management for them. Correct, okay. correct, correct. So, um, otherwise, yeah. they could not offer multiple insurance policies because adverse selection can happen if the number of policies is greater than one. So they do it with this holdback which is based on, you know, there is great persistence of adverse, of sick people. Right. So they can pretty accurately compute that if these people move into that policy, here's what the costs will be. And they hold back enough money or they price the other policies sufficiently so that they can cover the sick. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we had a podcast a uh, few weeks ago on medical tourism. And, you know, as, as we move forward here, as you say, 36 trillion in liabilities in Medicare, uh, we are going to get into some sort of an unsustainable position to, to manage this. And uh, we are already seeing, you know, uh, cities like Cleveland and Houston sort of specializing in this area. And uh, uh, it, it you know with scale they can get really good at it from a cost perspective too. I agree. Yeah, I agree. I've long um, been a proponent of what I called focused factories, and that is healthcare institutions that focus on particular diseases. I think we have focus on surgeries. And that's good, you know, places that focus on joint replacements are clearly going to be better at it than places that do everything for everybody. Yeah. But the real drivers of healthcare costs in the U.S. and most other countries are chronic diseases. And the chronic diseases are not one disease. They're a whole galaxy of diseases. Right. And the people who have these diseases, their care is uncoordinated. Mm. 
Hmm. And they themselves are so sick, but they have to coordinate. You know, the diabetic needs to coordinate with the cardiologist. And it can't be just any cardiologist because the diabetic heart is very different from a normal normal kind of heart or even from a diseased heart that emanates from another cause. So I think what we will see is institutions that care for all the comorbidities Mm -hmm. of these chronic diseases, which are not to be crass, but these are huge markets, hundreds of billions of dollars of mismanaged, inefficient, unnecessarily ineffective care. And if we had a more competitive system, these institutions could arise rather than everything for everybody. But Gil, I think the savings won't just come from medical tourism. It'll come once once you have competition, Mm-hmm. You either get out of business or you get better. Yeah. So it may not be needed that cardiovascular cases go to Cleveland. It may be that back home, wherever you are, the prime institution says, well, yeah, I'm yeah. going to compete with Cleveland. I, I can make this happen. Right, right, right. Yeah, I fully agree. Um, so I want to jump into a, a different topic. So this is your upcoming book, and it's about innovate, innovation in healthcare. Yes. And this is really, you know, sort of your experience and expertise in this arena for a long time. Uh, you know, a, a startup and uh, a new company thinking about uh, innovating in healthcare what are the things that they have to really think about, right? Uh, right. And, and you have three right. different pillars sort of laid out. Right. Yeah. right. Thank you, Gil. <laughs> <laughs> Self-serving promo, yes. So I teach this course, and I teach it because my observations were, as I said, that we need innovation. Furthermore, that it's feasible. It's not like mRNA or new proteins for the COVID vaccine. Mm. These are things that are doable. But the people who think of them don't think through these three pillars. And they're of the ilk, if you build it, they will come. And very often they build it and nobody comes or not enough people come. So... What are the three pillars that enable the innovator to avoid this problem? One is to be very clear on what you're trying to do. I call this, what am I? And um, I'll give you an example in retail medical centers. Mm -hmm. So there's one that's called One Medical It was started by Tom Lee, a very brilliant physician who's also an expert in in digital health. One one medical has a, just went public a little while ago, Mm -hmm. has a market cap of about 3.4 billion, even though it's lost money. (laughs) So what's what's the key with one medical? Mm -hmm. One medical is located in business areas, uh, and its premise is we're going to serve the business customer very conveniently. So if you come in here, you're not going to be a patient, meaning you'll wait, wait, wait and be patient. We're going to serve you right away. Contrast this with another retail medical center that was located in suburban areas, little suburban towns, and wasn't clear what it was going to do. Mm -hmm. Was it going to be lower cost than the physicians, the regular primary care, or was it going to serve the consumer as conveniently as one medical. It said it would do both. It's impossible to do both. It's impossible to be low cost 
and consumer facing. So the one medical, very clear, very clear first pillar, very clear about what it is. Health stop, all confused. Hmm. Low cost means you're poorly staffed. Convenient to the consumer means you've got staff running out the door, for example. Hmm. Second part is how will the environment around you accept you? Yeah. Let's go back to one medical. It's in business areas. Hmm. How many physicians are there in business areas? Number pretty close to zero. Hmm. So they're not competing with anybody. And the consumers like them, very convenient. The employers like them instead of the employees saying, well, you know, I've got to take a day off because I have to go yeah, to the doctor. Yeah, they can come back to work. They, they go right back to one medical. Yeah. Health stop. Health stop. They're competing with well-established local primary care providers mm -hmm. who really don't want the competition. And in the absence of either lower costs or better quality or greater consumer convenience, HealthStop is going to lose. So these, this is an example of the factors in the environment that the innovator has to think about. Am I well aligned with them or am I poorly aligned with them? One medical, I don't own one medical stock. I have no stake in them. I know Tom Lee. I admire <laughs> him, but that's all. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. One medical is perfectly aligned with the six factors. Mm. The third pillar is the business model itself. And you know business model skill. I know yeah. you know all this, but they're complicated. But let's take one element of the business model. How much of the market do I need to get to break even? Mm -hmm. So HealthStop is open 24-7. It's got a physical facility. It's staffed by doctors and nurses. One medical is in business areas, so it closes when business hours are closed. And I told you that Tom Lee was a great digital health expert. Yes. So much of its work is done by telemedicine. So from a business perspective, the fixed assets you need to invest in HealthStop are much, much greater than those you need to invest in one medical. And one medical has a much bigger market because it has no competition, whereas HealthStop is competing against community doctors. So on the third pillar, the business model pillar, HealthStop needed something like half the market to break even. One medical needs less because it's got so much less invested in fixed assets. Yeah. But even if it needed more of a market share, it could get it because it's virtually no competition. So that's what my book explicates. Yeah. How do you know what you're trying to do? How do you know if you're aligned with the six factors or not? And if you're not, what can you do to get better aligned? And what are, there are 10 elements to this business model. The last one, by the way, is do good. Make sure you're <laughs> doing good while you do all of this. How do you judge whether you have a viable business model or not? The one, uh, so my three types of innovations are those that control costs, that commercialize technology, or that make consumers' lives better. Yeah. And different. They're just different. They require different skills, different alignments. They're different. The one uh, big exception here is technology facing mm -hmm. where if you don't have good accountability forget about it 
<laughs> it's just, you know, you're, you can do one thing, and that is in the other models, there's a lot to do to test whether it's viable or not. In the technology commercialization, if you can't pass the accountability hurdles, you know, shut the door, turn out the lights. Well, so what do you mean by the accountability hurdle? So the accountability is a demonstration to your stakeholders that you do what you say you're going to do. Yeah. So if it is a consumer facing innovation, it would be to say to the, look, I make your life easier. Mm-hmm. I think Tom Lee with One Medical can make that claim to the people working in these business areas. Uh, in uh, cost cutting, it would be that you really cut costs, that you reduce or control the rate of increase of cost. Yeah. In technology, it's clearly that you're safe and effective. Yeah, so, so what you're saying is that there has to be a focus, technology cost, uh, or consumer facing uh, yes. business model, and you have to be able to demonstrate that. Uh, yes, right? that there has to be a focus in in, in uh, sort of uh, accountability and demonstration. And healthcare industry, unlike you know sort of the typical industry, is a little different, right? So you could you could conceive variety of products. There are entrenched players in the market. Um, sometimes there are significant switching costs to, uh, you know, to, to consumers. And so you, what you're saying, I think, is uh, you have to sort of pick your battle in a, in a, in a really thoughtful way. Absolutely. You put it very well. But in healthcare, one thing that's missing is accountability. So I just had another editorial in Bloomberg And it's in all of my books, and that is, I bemoan the awful absence of any transparency. Mm. So, you know, when I buy a yogurt right on the can, it tells me what the ingredients are, the price is, the percentage of my calories, the RDA is, tells me a lot. That's just yogurt. Suppose I needed a mastectomy. What would I know about the doctor who's going to perform it, her team, the hospital in which she practices in doing mastectomies on women like me? I would know zero. And I know how to find data in healthcare. So another editorial I just published was yeah I was uh, yeah I was going to close yeah. that. so this this is entitled the U S needs an S C C for its healthcare yeah. system a, yeah. a new truth agency uh, could lower costs and improve value in American medicine I really like this idea Reggie that uh, thank you you yeah you are trying to buy products as you say here uh, with no understanding of the quality or or the price trade off on those yeah. products right and you don't even know how many different markets exist you could actually buy the same product in market a and market b absolutely. and you often you're not even aware of the existence of market absolutely. b absolutely right? yeah absolutely you're i mean it's just stunning when you think let's say about buying a car and how much you know about a product like a car and people say, oh, pew, a car, but a car is actually a very complicated electronic device. Most people have no idea how it runs, but because of transparency of good data, it's become better and cheaper over time. We need that for healthcare, and I've, I've been preaching this for 30 years now, hmm. and Nothing has happened. All sorts of fake agencies and <laughs> fake portals have come up. Right. I still can't answer my question. I need a mastic. I do not, thank heaven. But if I did need one, where would I find the information I wanted? Nowhere. So I think the SEC finally forced businesses 
We're just like healthcare or like anybody else. Yeah. Everybody likes transparency, except if it's about them. So the businesses said, no, trust us, and we're wonderful, and how dare you question our motives until the Great Depression came. Mm. And Franklin Delano Roosevelt said, I've had it, you know, you're now going to report data following GAP, and it will be audited data. Right. And if you abuse these rules, the SEC can throw you in jail or penalize you financially in a very hefty way. Hmm. And that cleaned up the market. It's not perfect, but it's the best in the world. I think that's what we need in healthcare, an agency that has criminal prosecu prosecutorial powers. Yeah finding powers and that's dominated but not by industry experts who are trying to protect their little their stake but by measurement experts you know right. um, accountants economists uh, epidemiologists people who are interested in measuring things well yeah so it might be that there could be a cfo like person who's accountable for it. So there is obviously some financial data, but also uh, performance metrics right? that, could, that could be sta standardized. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. And they say, well, risk adjustment is critical yeah. because you're a young man, I'm an old woman. Clearly, uh, the data that are relevant to you are different from what's relevant to me. And risk adjustment is posed as if it were something like the unified theory of relativity. But in fact, uh, uh, Markowitz won the Nobel Prize for developing beta, the measure of risk in financial analysis. And it's been repetitively refined. It's pretty good. Mm -hmm. I don't think risk analysis, forgive me, is it's a problem and it'll take smart minds to work it out. Oh, yeah. But it's doable. Right. It's a doable problem. And then we'll have metrics that will enable me to find metrics that are relevant for me and you to find metrics that are relevant for you. Yeah, yeah. So, so in conclusion, Reggie, uh, I would like you to speculate. So we are 65 days away from the, uh, from election. Uh, whoever wins, if you look forward five years from now, where do you think we will be in terms of, I'm, I'm talking about the healthcare system. Where, where do you think we are most likely going to end up in? Well, I think, uh, <laughs> I think that whether you're like Trump and primarily interested, it seems to me, in the state of the economy, or like Biden and interested in social issues, mm -hmm. we have to do something to con something bipartisan yeah. to control healthcare costs, which would then enable more people to have access to health care. So I'm hopeful about this bipartisan public option proposal yeah. as a way of doing that. I am not hopeful about the transparency because it took Franklin Delano Roosevelt a man of incredible vision and guile, mm. you know, incredible political skills to get the SEC passed. Yeah. I don't see that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I did, but I don't see that in either candidate. Yeah. Uh, and I, of I'm... course, the status quo does want transparency the largest employer in every state. It's just not going to happen. But uh, getting a bipartisan public option, that'd be great. Right. Yeah. So, I, you know, I, I'm 
thinking of suggesting some sort of a constitutional amendment, Reggie, that says if in the future the country finds itself uh, in any problem that exceeds its current GDP, yeah, it, it has to get, you know, <laughs> there has to be some sort of a bipartisan. Uh, oh, that would be great. <laughs> that would be great. Because, you know, uh, what you said earlier and just is actually quite true. So I've been in the Congress quite a bit, and the people there are incredibly brilliant, so, so much uh, more clever and thoughtful than of different points of view uh, than somebody like me would ever be. But they don't really understand healthcare. It's mm. very complicated. <laughs> So, a, you know, they may have, depending on their state, they may know a lot about oil or, <laughs> you know, or agricultural equipment or whatever. Right. But healthcare is kind of ubiquitous, it's a problem everywhere. It's not unique to any state and it's very complex. Your amendment would force them to pay attention and not to have silly little superficial solutions. That's right. That's right. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, this has been great, Reggie. Thanks so much for spending time with me. It was delightful. When I saw you were a CPA, Gil, I teach accounting as well as healthcare. I knew we'd have a great time. Thanks so much. I'm a CFA um, uh, Reggie, so I don't actually know that much accounting, but uh, I know there's uh, a bit of finance. <laughs> okay. You know quite a bit of finance uh, uh, looking at your record. So that's great, Gil. I hope I hear from you again. All the best. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.